The United States of America is a nation that craves, craves acceptance, craves popularity, craves glory, craves the things of this world. It is a nation that is occupied with the body, with the way that we look, with what we have, what we possess. We are in trouble because I'm telling you that when we exalt ourselves, a holy God has to bring us down. We'll talk about it today. If you could plan the scenario of your life, if you could live out your dream, where would you be? What would it be that you would desire above all else? What recognition, what glory, what fame, what's in your dreams? Is it that or is it holiness? What are you looking at? Are you looking at today or are you looking at a future? where you are going to be face to face with God. This is what we want to talk about in this final day of study as we look at Isaiah 22, as we finish it, and look at Isaiah 23. What is God's final word for us this week? As we have studied this God who purposes, this God who plans, this God who says, as I have planned, so it shall come to pass. And what I have purposed, no man can thwart. What do we need to see? Well, I want us to return to Isaiah chapter 22. We left you there, and remember, it is the oracle, the oracle concerning the valley of vision. It's an oracle that is given to Judah, as even Isaiah 21 is an oracle that has Judah as the recipient of the message. In chapter 21, they have looked to man for deliverance, and here they are doing the same thing. In chapter 22, he says, I am weeping. I am weeping for the day of the Lord, for the Lord of hosts has a day of panic. The Lord God of hosts, God Almighty has a day of panic, subjugation and confusion in the valley of vision. And he's talking about Jerusalem and he tells how Elam is even coming and coming against Jerusalem and how they're building up their defenses and how they're trying to get ready for this siege. And we believe possibly that it is the time of Sennacherib, a time that we will study later on, even in the book of Isaiah, as Sennacherib comes against Jerusalem when Hezekiah is king. And he is king at this point because we have been told in Isaiah 14 in the year that King Ahaz died. Well, the son of Ahaz is Hezekiah. But it tells how he removed the defense of Judah in verse 8. It says, In that day you depended on the weapons of the house of the forest. In verse 11 it says, But you did not depend on him who made it, nor did you take in consider into consideration him who planned it long ago. What is God's message for you this week? It is to take into consideration God who has purposed, God who has planned, God who has promised you as a child of God that all things will work together for good. What are they doing instead of seeking God? It says in verse 12, therefore in that day, there's another in that day that you want to mark. The Lord God of hosts called you to weeping and to wailing, to shaving the head, to wearing sackcloth. He says, you were in trouble. 
And he said, I wanted you to weep. I wanted you to wail. I wanted you to put on sackcloth. I wanted you to mourn because you're in trouble. And what were you doing? Listen, they were parting. Instead, there is gaiety and gladness, the killing of cattle and the slaughtering of sheep, eating of meat and drinking of wine. Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Let's enjoy it while we can. Let's get the benefits of this life. And they forget that there is life after death. They're looking at the temporal rather than at the eternal. They're looking at their own means of deliverance instead of depending upon God. And so he goes on and he tells them, but the Lord of hosts revealed himself to me. Surely this iniquity will not be forgiven you until you die. Why will it not be forgiven? Because at the time when you were supposed to be weeping over sin, mourning and grieving over sin, you didn't do it. That is an iniquity. It is an iniquity, listen to me carefully, to laugh about sin. It is iniquity to deal with sin lightly because it is sin that separates you from God. And this is what he is saying to them. And this is what you and I need to understand. There is a time to weep. There is a time to wail. There is a time to fast. There is a time to seek God. And that is what Joel chapter 2 is talking about. It is the day not for revelry, not for parting, not for continuing as we are going. It is a time for the church to call a solemn assembly. It is the time for us to fast. It is the time for us to pray. It is the time for us to weep so that God might hear and that God might send revival. That's what he did at our men's conference. I mean, they were smitten by the word of God. Here were men weeping and, 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 and confessing their sin. A group got on a bus. They're going home. They're playing praise music. And all of a sudden, the spirit of God falls on them. And they begin to weep. They begin to confess their sins. And they go home. And the women say, it is a new church. It is a new husband. It is a new day. This is what's supposed to happen. But then he goes from the, to the nation, from the nation in this valley of vision to the individual. And he talks about Shebna. He says, go to the steward to Shebna or Shebna, who is in charge of the royal household. Here's a man in a place of great prominence. And it says, what right do you have here? And whom do you have here that you have hewn a tomb for yourself here? You who hewn a tomb on the height. You who carve a resting place for yourself in the rock. He says, here you are focused on you, on your glory, on the fact that you were erecting this monument, this tomb to you. You can't do it as a nation. You can't do it as an individual. Behold, the Lord is about to hurl you headlong. And he's talking to this individual. He says, you, he is about to grasp you firmly, roll you up as a ball and cast you into a far country. God is through with you. God is disgusted with you. Why? Because it's your glory that you're interested in and not my glory. Here you carry the keys of the household on your shoulder. You're the head of the household, the household of David. And this is the way you're acting. And God would say the same to us. You're a child of God. And is this the way you're acting? Is this what you are doing? It says in verse 18, and to roll you tightly like a ball to cast you into a far country. There you will die. And there your splendid chariots will be. You shame of your master's house. I want to ask you a question, beloved. And I ask myself at the same time, am I ashamed to my master's house? Or am I a credit to the kingdom of God? What am I? 
the way I dress, the way I talk, the way I treat people, the way I fulfill my calling as a woman, as a man, the way that I, am I seeking my own glory or am I seeking the glory of the Lord? Am I willing to decrease that he might increase as John the Baptist said? He says, I will depose you from your office. I will pull you down from your station. Then it will come about in that day that I will summon my servant, Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him, Eliakim, with your tunic and tie your sash securely about him. I will entrust him with your authority and he will become a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. You've been concerned about yourself, but this man will become a father. He will care about them because it's the father that sacrifices. It's the father that lays down for the benefit of the children. He says, then I will set the key of the house of David on his shoulder. What does he mean? Well, the head of the household wore on his tunic, on what, on his clothing, on his shoulder, the key. It was the master key. And he says, you're of the house of David and I will put the key on you. When he opens, no one will shut. And when he shuts, no one will open. In other words, he will have that supreme authority. And you can find that verse in Philadelphia in the letter to the church at Philadelphia. I've set before you an open door which no one can shut and which no one can open because I have set that door before you. He goes on to say, I will drive him like a peg in a firm place. I'm going to put him up there. I, God, am going to do that. But then he goes on to say, so he will become the throne of glory to his father's house. He wasn't seeking glory, but I'm going to give him glory because he wasn't seeking glory. So they will hang on him all the glory of his father's house, offspring and issue, all the least of the vessels from bowls to jars. He will all hang on him the source of glory, the head of the household, the one that carries on his shoulder the key of David. In that day, declares the Lord of hosts, the peg driven in a firm place will give way. It will even break off and fall, and the load hanging on it will be cut off, for the Lord has spoken. What is God saying? God is saying judgment is coming. This is the uh, oracle. This is the vision in this, in, in this valley of vision. This is what's going to happen. You are not going to last. You are going to be judged. Why? Why? Because, and because you are judged, the peg will not stay in the place. This kingdom, this throne, so to speak, is going to come to an end for a while because you are going, he doesn't say it here, but they are going to be taken into captivity by Babylon. It is coming. Why? Because God will share his glory with no man. We'll talk about it in just a minute. Well, beloved, we have come to our final day of the week, our final day of study. We have come to the final chapter that we intended to get to. You ought to applaud. We've come to chapter 23. But I want you to get several things down about Isaiah 22. I want you to have something to remember from every chapter. And when you think of Isaiah chapter 22, just think of calamitous times. What are we to do in calamitous times when things are not going well? Well, number one, we are to live not for the present, but for 
the future. God has planned. God has purposed. And this is what we see in chapter 22. We are not to be caught up in the present as they were in verse 12 and 13 and parting, but we are to live for the sure future. Number two, you are to depend on God. You are to see that it is he who has planned it. It says you did not take into consideration him who planned it long ago. He said you should, you should take it into consideration. And then I want you to see this, that God judges not only nations, but he judges individuals. You can not exalt yourself and get away with it. And that's what we see as we come to Isaiah chapter 23. It's the oracle concerning Tyre. Now, when you think of Tyre, think of Lebanon. When you think of Lebanon, just remember that at one time, one time, Beirut, Lebanon was considered one of the most learned cities in all of the Middle East. It was the center of learning and the center of Arab culture. The effects, though, of civil and political war brought instability and brought this city down in an amazing, amazing way so that now you look at it and you think, I would not even recognize it. What is the message as you look at it there and as you look at it here? The message is this, that God's plan is always to bring down the pride of man. The oracle concerning Tyre. Whale, O ships of Tarshish. Now the ships of Tarshish were over close to Spain in the Mediterranean Sea. They were famous ships. They had a certain style and they carried the wealth of nations. You could find them on different seas because they were hired to do that, as Isaiah 37, 12 says. It is reported to them from the land of Cyprus. Look at your map and see Cyprus off the coast of, of uh, Lebanon. And it says, be silent, you inhabitants of the coastland. You merchants of Sidon, your merchants cross, your messengers cross the sea and were on many waters. The grain of the Nile, the harvest of the river was her revenue and she was the market of nations. Be ashamed, O Sidon. Tyre and Sidon are right there on the coastline up along what is present day Lebanon. And it says, be ashamed, O Sidon, for the sea speaks, the stronghold of the sea, saying, I have neither travailed nor given birth. I have neither brought up young men nor reared virgins. When the report reaches Egypt, they will be in anguish at the report of Tyre. Why? Because Tyre is being brought down and Egypt benefits from Tyre. The nations benefit from Tyre. Pass over to Tarshish. Wail, O inhabitants of the coastland. Is this your jubilant city whose origin is from antiquity, whose feet used to carry her to colonize distant places? I mean, Tyre was like Babylon is going to be. I mean, it was this magnificent, magnificent city, this magnificent country. And, and here they were shipping things, the wealth of the nations all over the known world at that time. And it says, uh, who has planned this against Tyre? Do you see that word planned again? The bestower of crowns, whose merchants were princes. I mean, the merchants, the princes served Tyre because of the wealth and what they were doing, whose traders were the honored of the earth. Who has planned this, he asked. And here's your answer. The Lord of hosts has planned it to defile the pride of all beauty. And when I see the word pride, I just put an arrow going up. Why? Because when you see that, you see man exalting himself, lifting himself up. It says the Lord of hosts has planned it to defile the pride of all beauty, the, uh, to despise all the honored of the earth. You may have the accolades of the world, beloved, but God is going to bring you down. God will not allow us, God will not allow us to exalt ourselves and to walk in pride. 
God is able to abase the proud. And he gives grace and he raises up the humble. And if we exalt ourselves, he has to bring us down. It says, overflow your land like the Nile, O daughter of Tarshish. There is no more restraint. He has stretched out his hand over the sea. Now remember, we have seen him stretch out his hand in Isaiah chapter 21. He is stretching his hand now out over the sea. The sea where all the wealth of Tyre goes all over the world on the ships of Tarshish. It says he has made the kingdoms tremble. The Lord has given a command concerning Canaan to demolish its strongholds. He has said, you shall exalt no more, O crushed virgin daughter of Zion. Arise, pass over to Cyprus. Even there you will find no rest. You can say, okay, I'll redeem myself, but you can't get away from me because I have stretched out my arm, my hand across the sea. It says, Behold, the land of the Chaldeans, this is the people which was not. Assyria appointed it for desert creatures. They erected their siege towers. They stripped its palaces. They made it a ruin. What makes you think, Tyre, that you can get away with this? Look at what God let Assyria do to Babylon. You can't get away with it. Wail, O ships of Tarshish, for your stronghold is, is destroyed. Now in that day, Tyre will be forgotten for 70 years. Like the days of one king, at the end of 70 years, it will happen to Tyre as in the song of the harlot. It says, take your harp and walk around the city, you harlot, and sing your song as you walk around the city. He says, O oh, forgotten harlot, pluck the strings skillfully, sing many songs that you may be remembered. It will come about at the end of 70 years that the Lord will visit Tyre, that she will go back to her harlot's wages and will pay, play the harlot with all the kingdoms on the face of this earth. She's going back, but know this, her gain and her harlot's wages will be set apart to the Lord. It will not be stored up or hoarded, but her gain will become sufficient food and choice attire for those who dwell in the presence of the Lord. In other words, what is he saying? He is saying this. Number one, God's plan is always to bring down the pride of man. Number two, you can labor, you can attain but God will take it away and use it for his own purposes. You think you're getting it for yourself. And God says, oh no, I'm going to take it from you and I am going to give it to someone else. God cannot allow man to walk in pride. God cannot allow man to exalt himself. You know, Ezekiel 37, the last chapter, I mean the last verse, verse 20, Ezekiel 27, the last verse, verse 36 says this, and Tyre will be destroyed forever. That's what God says about pride. Congratulations, faithful one, diligent student of the Word of God. We have completed another section of Isaiah. We have come to the end of the oracles of the nations. Now in chapter 24, oh my goodness, you, I, when I read chapter 24 of Isaiah, I just, I, I was overwhelmed. I was absolutely overwhelmed. I was awestruck at the power of God, at the authority of God. And what leads us up to that? This is your precept for life this week. It is to remember that God has a plan, that God has a purpose. And as he plans long ago, so it will surely come to pass. And while it may be difficult, 
while it may be hard, while it may be, in a sense, a harsh vision, you and I are to look to God. You and I, precious one, are just to absolutely cling to God. And we are to keep ourselves humble. We are to depend on Him and not depend on ourselves. We need to remember that the arm of flesh will fail us, but the arm of God is our everlasting strength because He is El Olam, the everlasting God. And you need to look not at the temporal, but you need to look at the eternal for the things that can be seen are temporal. The things that cannot be seen are eternal. Therefore, we need to keep our eyes on eternity. We need to pray God's stamp eternity upon my eyes. And no matter what comes your way, no matter what you go through, no matter the grief, the sorrow, the way to make it is to look heavenward and say, Oh God, as you have purpose, so it is coming to pass. And what you have planned will surely happen. And God, I know that if you have purposed it, if you have planned it, then you promise me that it is going to work together for my good. You are going to use it to make me like Jesus. You know what? I just wish I could put my arms around you. I wish I could give you just a big old hug. I wish I could push you away from me and look you square in the face and pat you on the face and say thank you. Thank you for taking your Christianity seriously. Thank you for loving God. Thank you for honoring His Word by studying it. Thank you, beloved. Thank you for watching today. To download your free copy of the study guide or to find out more about Precept Ministries International, click on our website or call us today at 1-800-763-1990. Join us for our next program as Kay shares more Precepts for Life. It is a time for the church to call a solemn assembly. It is the time for us to fast. It is the time for us to pray. It is the time for us to weep so that God might hear and that God might send revival. Join us for our next program as we discover more Precepts for Life.